Okay, are we good to go? Yep, get underway again, just so we can make up some time. So this is session three. This session, we're still going to be looking at case studies, but we're also going to be moving forwards towards future planning and considerations about what's been observed and how it can be used as lessons. Um, first up, I'm very pleased to introduce AJ Perkins. AJ is with the New South Wales Saving Our Species team and is going to be sharing some of his observations and learnings about good fire and bad fire. Thank you, AJ. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start off first by acknowledging um, country and their custodians. Um, and pay our respects to um, the traditional owners and First Nations people in um, the lands that we're all meeting on today. Um, pay respect to their elders, um, past, present and emerging, as well as pay respect to the community for their ongoing connection to country and um, custodianship. Uh, I'm a Gumbengiro man from Coffs Harbour area. I'd like to acknowledge uh, my ancestors and uh, my country as well. Um, a bit about me. So I've been a part of the fire space for about over 10 years now. Um, I've had the opportunity to work across uh, all different fire grounds and with different fire agencies. Um, I've been involved a lot in my area around community um, drive in the cultural burning space and and, and pushing fire um, back on country, um, understanding that um, from a cultural context. Um, I have recently and promotion and support and capacity for communities to reestablish uh, fire on country. debate around cultural burning as opposed to uh, has reduction or other methods of fire. I wanted to talk on the understanding and cultural essence of First Nations people and that connection to, country, uh, to fire in country, that understanding that fire belongs to country. Um, in, in, in essence, is a being. We understand that as First Nations people through story, um, through ceremony, through law, um, through kinship, and through totemic systems. Um, we understand it's an integral part of this country, and knowledge has been passed down for. 65,000 years focused around fire and its role it plays in this country. It is kinship to not only us, but everything in country. Specific species are, are uh, more, I guess, They 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 have play a, a specific role for specific species. We got to start to view uh, fire as an integral part of this country moving forward. Um, we need to start to draw on re-establishing this understanding and building the resilience back into country. I came across this artwork, which I think depicts what culture, the wider society, wider society of a, of Australia, views fire um, in the context of it's it's the enemy, it 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 doesn't belong. It's this threat, um, and and I'm not taking it away from. Uh, like I said, I was part of the 2019 and 2020 fires and seen the devastation firsthand. I fought to protect live and prop lives and property, but its viewpoint as a whole is that it's a threat to 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 everything. I guess this is what it, 
it's depicted as. Um, we need to start to change the viewpoint and understanding how fire relates to country and how it belongs. We, we, we gear up every year with this reactive mindset around going to war. We give our firefighters up with equipment. We purchase essentially ex-military equipment to go against, to, to prepare ourselves in a reactive context to fire. We're, we're fighting this thing every year and to to the context from culture, having that mindset towards something that's kin, that belongs, is is totally the opposite of what we should be moving forward towards. It's it's this understanding of or what's this culture around fortress management and limitations to perceived threats and things that might not fit in the box or the understanding in the realm of what was or <clears throat> what could be. I think it's needing to be a reshift and focus around understanding fire belongs and we coexist in this landscape with not only just it, but the species, the trees, the ants, the insects. They all belong and we all belong and we're all kin and we're all on the same level. And there's a broad understanding that fire can be nurturing. We we have these things in our homes, the fireplaces, you sit around a campfire when you go out camping. There's all this understood, there's this, this is embedded deep understanding of fire. But the focus has kind of shifted a little bit. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, when we talk about good fire, bad fire, I think that the land should view more towards fire being kin and belong to this land as opposed to let's fight this thing every year. Um, that's kind of my presentation. Thank you, AJ. That's Thanks. really important reframing um, of the way we think about things. Um, we're going to move on now to Jeff Pegg and Tilly. Um, Davis, they're going to be building on what AJ has been talking about, actually, and uh, talking from Bundjalung country about impacts of fire and disease, particularly myrtle rust. Um, so Jeff is going to take us away. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. That's all up and good now. Excellent. No worries. Thanks that, AJ, and it was good to see you looking so young in some of those shots. Uh, um, unfortunately, Tilly's uh, been unwell, uh, so she's not joining us today. Um, but uh, I have worked with with Tilly on, on Gari and the other Butchler Land Sea Rangers, um, and I acknowledge uh, the work that I've done with those guys and the privilege to, to work with those guys and, uh, and uh, the other landsmen which we've done this work. Uh, so as Chantel um, said, well, the focus of this work is really on, on myrtle rust and looking at the impacts post-fire. Um, I guess not everyone may know what myrtle rust is, um, so maybe I should explain that first. That, um, it's a disease caused by the, the rust fungus Ostropuxinia sidii, uh, which was exotic to Australia and, until it was accidentally introduced um, in 2010 and is now well established in our native ecosystems along the East Coast. Um, Unfortunately, what we've seen post-fire is that plant recovery with all that nice new flush uh, just creates ideal conditions for the spread of the, the fungus, Ostropuxinia sidii, and then the development of disease, um, which is really unfortunate. Um, from these studies, um, we basically did uh, work all the way from um, the tip of Gari all the way down to the New South Wales Victoria border. We were a little bit restricted because of COVID um, in terms of getting to Victoria at the time. Um, but in those studies, we found a whole range of different species, a whole range of different ecosystems affected. Uh, we found new f field host records. So some that we'd seen before in Glasshouse, but never actually recorded in, in field were getting infected. Um, things like the Syncarpia hilii or the Satinae that grows on, on Garia, a perfect example. Um, we also saw impact on range restricted species. And I'm gonna talk about these two in a minute, Eurymertus Eurom uh, australis and the Rhodamnia rubescens. Um, and then impact on, on some of the common species like the, the Melaleuca uh, and the eucalyptus species. 
Um, in our Gondwana rainforest and, and Rhodamnia rubescens before the arrival of rust uh, was quite common, um, obviously not threatened at all. Um, you could see it all the way from south of New, uh, south of Sydney all the way up to about the Gympie Meribah region. Uh, but post rust, it's 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 actually been um, listed as uh, critically endangered on the EPBC Act. So when we went back and had a look at the impacts post fire, um, we found 96 trees across all these sites in the Gone Wine Rainforest areas, and found that 80% of those um, with susceptible flush at the time had infection, um, and 70% of those um, had some evidence of dieback. And that was a one-off survey, but. We did some sites where we did return surveys, including the Washpool National Park, uh, where the first assessment we found there were 52% uh, of trees uh, with dieback. We came back about a year later and that uh, number had increased to 84.44%. So there, it was obviously evident that we needed longer term monitoring, but the, incre uh, the over time we were going to see an increase in the level of dieback of that, that species. Uh, so you remember saw the, the peach myrtle um, is in that uh, nightcap range and obviously already had a restricted range and is already on that one of those threatened lists or one of those species under threat. Um, when we initially looked at this, 55% um, of the individuals that were recovering from fire uh, were found to be infected. Um, there was additional studies. We only did one real study in, um, of our own in that site, but there were additional studies done um, by the New South Wales SOS program. Uh, they went back to a lot of these sites and found 100% of of those that are affected fire, uh, by fire to have some level of infection there. Uh, similarly, in, in Mount Jus uh, Jerusalem, uh, they found 85% of individuals with infection. So obviously you've got a, a range restricted species here getting significantly impacted. And the most significant thing was that there was a continued decline of flower and fruit production. Uh, so the survival of that species long-term really needs to be monitored. Well, it's interesting that even though we've done a lot of work in the glasshouse and seen that the eucalypts are, are quite susceptible in, in glasshouse systems, uh, we'd never really seen a lot of impact in the field. And it wasn't until we started uh, seeing the recovery from fire uh, was the first time we've seen broad scale infection occurring on both reshoots and seedlings, particularly on the eucalyptus species uh, from the Carimbia side of things. They were more affected by a, an endemic pathogen post-fire, uh, so Quambalaria pitarica, which occurs, we know occurs uh, quite widely um, in Queensland and New South Wales. Um, it was really smashing. It was causing probably significant dieback of, of reshoots and seedlings of particularly Crimbia henryi. Um, from the rust perspective, Eucalyptus uh, pilularis was, and, and Eucalyptus planchoniana were probably the most affected uh, with seedling deaths. Um, and also um, trees reshooting um, killed in some situations, uh, but others were just severely impacted. What was interesting though, there was levels of what seemed to be resistance or field resistance in, uh, for both species. Uh, so that's a positive in that we're likely to see regeneration of those. In those reshooting trees, there was also um, evidence that, that um, there was a difference in canopy height. So the lower reshoots on the the, uh, the trees were more affected than those that were occurring um, high. So so the risk of, of losing a lot of these individuals or, or decline, dramatic decline of, of these eucalypt species seemed to be quite low. However, it's not so much the, the case for the Meluca species. Um, in particular, uh, we targeted the Meluca quinquinervia and Meluca nodosa, the prickly Meluca. Uh, we looked at populations in, in mainly in, in two sites, but we also spread across single surveys in multiple sites. Um, just going through and showing some images that on the left-hand side is a small tree form of the Meluca nodosa. Um, and you can see the reshoot there with all the tips uh, burnt off. And that's basically a typical sign of, of, um, of uh, metal rust coming in, infecting those, those new shoots and, and causing dieback. Uh, so repeated infection, repeated dieback results in the death of those reshoots and eventually death of the trees. And similarly, you can see there on a, a large diameter Meluca quinquinervia um, with all those reshoots showing evidence of, of severe uh, infection and severe dieback. And then on the right there on the, the um, banks of the Esk River, uh, there's some sm uh, narrow um, diameter um, trees where we found heavy infection on a high percentage of, of the number of trees. Um, this is looking just at the data that we accumulated. Uh, this is Yarangali Nature Reserve uh, for Meluca um, nodosa, which is where we fought and saw the, the small tree form because it's an inland area. Um, over the time of assessment, we were basically trying to assess monthly, uh, some delays because of flooding and other times just because of COVID restrictions getting across the border. 
Um, but with that re, uh, reinfection um, occurring over time, we um, assess 48% of, of trees were killed uh, by rust uh, as a result of that, that reshoot death. And the remaining trees, apart from three others, um, showed evidence of a severe dieback and like to, likely to have, have um, succumbed over time. Um, what was probably more alarming was that only 6% of trees produced flower um, and probably only two of those we saw were abundant. Um, so in terms of regeneration, um, yes, you might get some uh, seedling regeneration, but you're narrowing the genetic uh, diversity of that population quite significantly. Similarly, with the Meluca quinquinervia, this was, a, um, I guess, a large diameter stand, uh, and we saw 64% of the trees dead. Now, most of those um, had some evidence of, of rust. I don't think rust is the only thing that's that's killing us, uh, the Meluca quinquinervia. There was a lot of insect attack, um, but I think also the severity of the fire played the role in, in, in the death of some of these trees. But again, alarmingly, there was only 16% of the trees um, actually producing flower uh, during our assessment period. Um, I should point out, obviously, you know, we've stopped this work now, so we haven't been able to follow these plots through to look at the levels as to whether that flowering um, levels do change over time or recovery. Um, so that's that's one big gap in, in our data that we don't have. So looking at the Bunjalung uh, Meluca nodosa, this is a, a smaller heath form. Um, where we didn't actually see any deaths, um, but only 6% of the trees or, or three trees in our plots um, were found to be free of disease. Um, there was dieback on 85% of, of the trees within that site. Initially, when we uh, were assessing flowering, there was quite good flowering levels. And this was before we started to see all this branch dieback. So the branch dieback doesn't really take place until you get that, that repeated infection, infection occurring and repeated um, attack on that, that growing shoot. Um, and at that time in the 2021, 60% of individuals were flowering with five trees considered to be abundant flowers. Um, but in our ses second assessment in 2022, um, only 17% of, of individuals with only one tree producing abundant levels of flowering. So that's quite a dramatic decline in that population. Uh, just to show, I guess, visually uh, what we're talking about. So this is a, a survivor that's not showing ev any evidence of infection um, and producing massive amounts of, of flower. Um, and this is the sort of thing you get um, as a result of infection. So you can see the dieback there occurring on, on all the, the new shoots there, and you can see the smaller number of buds. And in the bottom right there, you can see where there's absolutely no flower bud occurring in the, the most severely affected individuals. As we saw in, in Yarangali uh, with Meluca quinquinervia, um, we had a couple of different plots there. One was a small diameter tree, and that was, uh, the other was a large diameter um, tree size. Um, and we saw in the first site, 30% tree deaths, but again, we're only seeing really low levels of flowering. So only three trees within that site were considered tolerant. They did have all have some level of infection on them, but, but three of them actually had what you'd call just minor infection and no severe dieback. Um, and they did flower, although the numbers of flowers were quite low. Um, in the area where we had all those mature trees, there's a lot of deaths occurring in that, that site. Um, and only three out of those um, that were killed um, didn't have rust on them. So there is some association there with rust. Again, the flowering levels were, were dramatically uh, decrease as a result of infection and obviously the deaths that were occurring. So we wanted to pose some, some question, <coughs> questions and I guess this goes on the back of, of what AJ was talking about. Um, you know, what's our, can we actually use fire as a bit of a tool? So in terms of Meluca nodosa, we know in undisturbed sites, we don't see a lot of rust. Um, but in disturbed sites where we do see fire going through, obviously rust comes in and the most susceptible ones are taken out. So can we actually use um, more frequent fires to actually accelerate uh, and identify resistant or tolerant individuals and use those as seed sources, either to naturally regenerate or to collect seed from uh, to assist with regeneration. The problem is obviously, if we've got these, if our plots that we've got are reflective of those whole areas where there's only low levels of resistance within those populations, are we actually selecting for really low and reduced genetic variation and increasing that potential for uh, inbreeding to occur? Uh, all questions at this point in time. The other thing I want to switch it around now that we're heading, I guess, into a dry period and potentially another fire season is does myrtle rust in some of these locations increase the risk of, of fire and the intensity of fire? Um, the site from the, the photo here that we're looking at is a wet sclerophyll so, uh, site that's in uh, Talabudra Valley. 
And we've seen deaths of, of understory, uh, mid-story trees in the you know, thousands and thousands of individuals uh, either standing dead or fallen dead um, in sites not only just in southeast Queensland, but also in New South, northern New South Wales. So if we had a fire into these sites, does that increase the, the intensity of that fire and damage the canopy um, of, of these sites, um, including obviously your brush box and your um, eucalyptus grandis? Um, so that's just a question to pose and how would we actually manage this sort of site in terms of do we need to put a fire through here to actually help manage it? Uh, just a quick thank you. There was a lot of people involved in this project, uh, but I particularly want to thank obviously the funding uh, bodies, the Plant Biosecurity Science Foundation, uh, the Threatened Species Recovery Hub and the Australian uh, Network for Plant uh, Conservation and the New South Wales uh, Department of Planning. And I think it's just environment now and not industry. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And pass on our thanks to Tilly as well for that work. Uh, now, anyone who's tried to do surveys on seedlings knows they can be pretty difficult to identify in the field. So our next speaker, Ruby Parisian, from the PA, doing a PhD at UNSW, is compiling a very helpful resource that you might be interested in learning about. You're on mute. Oh, cool. Okay, hopefully you can hear me now. Um, okay, so today I'm just presenting on a resource I've been working on. So it's a seedling image library, and I started with wet spherophyll forest species. Uh, oh, that didn't work. So I'd firstly just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land this research was undertaken on. So that's Bedigal, Darawal and Gadigal country. Uh, so my research focus is on threatened wet sclerophyll forest ecological communities, particularly those which were burnt during those 2019-2020 Australian megafires. And my sites were mainly in the Blue Mountains. Um, a large extent of extreme severity fire burned through here and it impacted a lot of wet sclerophyll forest. And these veg communities are considered ecotones. They transition between less fire prone rainforest and more fire tolerant dry sclerophyll forest. So changes in fire regimes such as these extreme severities may shift their composition. To quantify recovery at these sites, I conducted surveys above ground and took soil samples to find out the composition still existing below ground in the soil seed bank. And this primarily includes focusing on earlier stages of recruitment. But as fieldwork is costly and sites might be hard to access, robustly quantifying this post-fire recruitment is important to be able to predict this trajectory and composition of regeneration. But documenting this early growth is challenging and I'll show you why. If you were out in the field, would you be able to ID these seedlings? Uh, how about this one? And what about this one? Okay, by this stage, if you had no idea, you'd at least be able to use ID tools. This species is grown of variants and it has both distinct cotyledon shapes and first true leaves. However, this isn't commonly included in ID resources. While the use of photography for plant ID is growing, there still seems to be a lack of representation of all plant life stages. Juvenile stages are occasionally mentioned in descriptions, but images of seeds and even seedlings are rare. However, these images may be particularly useful in quantifying these earlier stages of recruitments in these post-fire environments. Currently, the majority of seedling images to aid ID is used for weed species. This guide here lists, lists both cotyledon features and first true leaves. Eucalyptus seedlings are possibly the most documented among native species, going all the way back to Margaret Flockton's watercolor plates depicting juvenile leaves. Uh, there are some attempts to represent native species. So this is a seed bank database for South Australia. It's available online and they've aimed to capture and include some images of various life stages. And this is primarily focused around seeds. So I aim to create a resource to aid in my own identification of these post-fire environments. I did this through germinating and photographing a range of common species that occur at my sites and threatened wet sclerophyll forest uh, using seed from the Australian Seed Bank. Uh, in New South Wales. I then formed an image library allowing me to flick through these images to look for similarities. However, while useful for my purpose, this does have larger applications. So I tried to represent various life history stages, including the cotyledons, which can be really distinct. 
There are very few resources that aim to document cotyledon shapes. This paper by Clifford from 1987 is one of the only I've seen referring to the diversity of shapes consistent with certain species. So for a variety of species germinated, I aim to document their cotyledon silhouettes. You can see the really distinct shape here of Pandoria pandorana, but there's also a few easy to spot patterns. Acacias have a common club wedge shape, eucalypts have a bilobed kidney shape, and senecios have a smaller club shape. As well as cotyledons, I also photographed the seed, the first true leaves, and the juvenile growth form. So Pandoria pandorana's juvenile growth form is really distinct from its adult form, and this is usually mentioned in ID descriptions, but it also has this really distinct cotyledon shape and a distinct seed. Documentation of these features made available alongside current ID data could provide a more holistic view of ID features for the entirety of its life history. Uh, so my seedling image library is freely accessible online, but I've also set up an iNaturalist project to encourage the documentation of seedlings and seeds through citizen science. Researching these post-fire environments means we are around seedlings often, so please start photographing and IDing seedlings and seeds, upload them to iNaturalist, add them to this project. At some point, we plan to establish a database to formalize this as an ID resource, encouraging this documentation of seedlings and seed images to represent this greater spectrum of the life history of plants. Uh, I'd just like to thank everyone who contributed. Yeah, that's gonna be very handy. Thank you, Ruby. Um, all right, we're gonna keep rolling now. We've got Dr. Teen McDonald coming up next, who's going to be talking about first aid for burnt bushland and this was developed by Arbor in response to a lot of questions about how people can help post bushfires. Um, Teen if you can share your screen that would be great. Looks like you're doing well and I'll leave it to you. Thank you very much. I've just got to toggle back to the beginning that's right. Um, good afternoon everybody. So uh, Arbor is a primarily a vegetation management and restoration NGO, uh, the Australian Association of Bush Regenerators. So this talk focuses on the impact of vegetation, uh, the impact of fire on vegetation and our first aid response to that. Uh, that doesn't mean that our community is not interested in in fauna, forgive us for not mentioning it, we do mourn the impact of climate drying on, on fauna and our ecosystems broadly. So in February 2020, Arba sprang into action. We implemented this uh, first aid program. It had two aims. Uh, firstly, to assist with um, post-fire natural regeneration. And so we reached out to uh, managers all along the East Coast, well, it particularly so the southeast Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria, uh, although COVID prevented us from engaging too much with those. In New South Wales, we were able to carry out emergency works in collaboration with site managers. These were sites in need of, of uh, immediate action post-fire. We our second aim was to uh, identify any need for plant reintroductions. Now, normally doesn't, uh, Arbor doesn't get involved with reintroduction because there's so much regeneration work to be done and so few people specialising in that area. Nonetheless, this was a very different experience. The black summer bushfires uh, appeared to be unprecedented and we were prepared to um, consider the need for reintroductions. If, to that end, we consulted um, key informants for their insights across uh, 20 areas and uh, our our information gained from that process and our on-ground works contributed to the case studies of uh, Greening Australia's Project Phoenix uh, report that Melinda will talk about later. So yes, we expected some uh, gains and losses. Gains because uh, bush regenerators who work in sclerophyll country know that you can get your best results in sclerophyll bushland after wildfire. <laughs> we try and use fire in our regeneration, but nothing is as good as wildfire. And this is because of fire adaptations, as Tony uh, talked about earlier. But losses, we had serious concerns um, for fire sensitive rainforest uh, and other fire sensitive species, including those in sclerophyll country. Um, 
obligate seeding eucalypts, for example, and also we were very concerned about uh, habitats for threatened species. Uh, so vegetation that may be important or key habitat or food plants for threatened species. Yep, our concerns were borne out and we had some uh, very good help from uh, three rainforest people in particular, Dylan Pugh, Mark Graham and Rob Coyman, who we thank for their insights. Um, this, these are photos taken at uh, Nightcap National Park. Um, found that uh, in terms of plants, there was substantial impact in some of the rainforest genera uh, that experienced, some experienced uh, mortality. Uh, There's huge canopy loss, as uh, Mark mentioned earlier, among rainforest species. Uh, and many uh, uh, seedling banks were affected, which is uh, peculiarly rainforest uh, a re resilience mechanism. Uh, however, there was regeneration potential uh, in the form of coppicing and uh, and shooting along the stems, which was really important uh, for many species. And there were even some rainforest uh, pioneers that uh, germinated from seed prolifically. Clarifal was also in trouble in some areas with uh, some severe uh, dead zones in many, many areas. This photo is, is of a site on a very steep slope in, on, in the Murrumbidgee catchment uh, taken from uh, Scottsdale BH, Bush Heritage's uh, conservation property, just looking across the river at this highly eroded <laughs> steep slope. This is 18 months after a fire and no canopy was evident. It has become evident now the canopy has recovered, but there is likely to have been some uh, compositional change. And we um, travelled around to vis different sites, uh, which many researchers would know very well and managers, um, where uh, fire sensitive eucalyptus species, uh, eucalyptus delicate tensors, fraxinoides, rossii, and others uh, were seemingly in trouble. Uh, we also looked at some of the cases where um, threatened uh, faunas, food plants, were, may be affected, including uh, uh, drooping she oak uh, on Kangaroo Island and um, and the uh, pl mountain plum pine, Podocarpus uh, laurentii, food of the endangered mountain pyg pygmy possums. So, thanks to all the managers who helped inform us about this. So. Uh, this is particularly interesting, the mountain pygmy uh, possum site. They live on boulder fields and they're all already stressed by dry conditions. So drought and fire play um, a huge role in, in um, reducing their or increasing their extinction pressures. Um, after the chase, we found reintroduction was actually only needed after fire if it was already needed before fire. This is not to say that there wasn't an impact, there was an impact. Um, however, planting or direct seeding was not gonna make the recovery any quicker. It will already take many decades for the rainforest specimens to uh, attain their pre-fire stature, but uh, we were advised by rainforest ecologists to leave the recovery to natural processes. And uh, we've observed that this has been the case for the sclerophyll uh, eucalypts, and the uh, food plants as well. So recovery did occur. There is a concern about consecutive fire and consecutive drought and grad gradual attrition of fire sensitive species. But in terms of first aid, uh, uh, we were not convinced there was a need for planting. And so working with Project Phoenix, uh, we came up with this diagram that we normally use in the Australian Association of Bush Regenerators that has a profile of, on the left side, you can see the intact uh, bushland and on the right, a cleared site. Uh, the orange is the weed and the green is the native. The oval uh, spots are where reintroduction is needed. And it's, you know, it, this illustrates our observation and that of many others that Reintroduction is definitely needed 
in these cleared areas, but we didn't find evidence of it being needed in bushland unless, you know, there were some special cases of threatened species, which were not our speciality. What we were mainly concerned about is helping people to manage the recovery process at the edges of the bushland where it interfaces with the degraded or cleared areas. This is where, in fact, there's potential for regeneration and the natives, natives are usually there. You don't usually need to reintroduce them. So the gains were borne out. We found fire adapted natives with surprising potential to recover from soil stored seed, bud banks and colonization. What we found the main need was, was for uh, management of weed. That was the main need. So this would not surprise you, post far lots of uh, nutrient, lots of opportunity, lots of space, uh, tobacco bush uh, recovering massively underneath uh, this uh, rainforest site. Uh, bush regenerators there in the background uh, getting to work. Um, uh, this is a management activity uh, undertaken by national parks. This wasn't a first aid uh, for burnt bush bushland project, but... Um, we collaborated in terms of sharing knowledge. Many volunteer projects had this very same response or many land managers had the very same weed problem and uh, we were able to help guide uh, their emergency response by providing uh, advice and in some cases, supervisors and trainers. Uh, another one here at Myrtle Creek in uh, Northern New South Wales, a land care site. Uh, again, Northern New South Wales, um, Inkweed in another national park estate was worked on and uh, it will be very interesting to observe or monitor whether the work in this case made us an appreciable, an appreciable difference compared to uh, sites that were not worked. So there's a potential research project for someone. Uh, yep, so re reducing the weed threat and taking advantage of the germination of valuable natives. These were triggered by the fire and in some cases threatened species. So we worked with mul multiple groups, individuals and uh, through organisations. Many people didn't know that this was actually all that was needed, <laughs> not planting, but to actually get out, watch what's there, don't just spray indiscriminately, look for what has come up and then undertake very tailored weeding uh, interventions. My final uh, example is um, this one at Scottsdale in Breadville in New South Wales that I have actually been involved in personally. It was one of Arbor's um, first aid for burnt bushland sites and we worked with bush heritage on this one. <clears throat> so before the fire, but after aerial spraying of dense African lovegrass, the site looked much like this. This isn't an exactly the site, but it's typical of what it appeared to be like ahead of the fire, dominated by weed, very little native evidence, uh, and the thatch stayed in place without any germination for quite some time. So people assumed it needed planting. Uh, however, we asked to come in after the fire and check, yes, uh, there were, there was a lot of a lot of loss of vegetation, but we saw the germination, especially with that wonderful rainfall. After the fire, we saw germination of natives uh, sufficient to um, uh, place uh, volunteers into the site on a regular basis and facilitate the recovery of that site, reducing the weeds, therefore reducing their potential to recharge the soil seed bank with weeds and uh, favouring the natives, that is, um, increasing their potential to recharge the seed bank with natives. And it worked a treat. Uh, he is on. Uh, no seed input was required. Um, and we had uh, at least oh, many more than 50 native species and 30 weed species. The work ended up with the site recovering largely with natives. Um, 
and it is now a site that's used as a demonstration site, it would have helped to have some sowing of common grasses at very weedy edges. That that could help to reduce the input, but it's interesting to be able to push the edges out and, and uh, allow the colonisation to continue. Yep, so there are some of the uh, native forbs. It's very forb rich, this, this grassy woodland, and some of those, as you see on the bottom left, slide, a Swainsona, um, Sericea is a threatened species. So let's not rush into reintroduction till you know what you've got and don't indiscriminately treat weed. Uh, look closely to see what you've got and then tailor your work in a very careful way. So thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Teen, and thanks to Arbor as well for developing that resource and doing the work. Uh, our last speaker for this session uh, is Dr. Melinda Pickup, who's from Greening Australia. As anyone who's tried to do restoration knows, seed supply can be an impediment. <laughs> so Melinda's been working as part of Project Phoenix to look at the seed supply gap. Thanks very much, Melinda. Thanks, Shan. Okay, can everybody see that all right? Just to get it to start. There we go. All right, and thanks. Thanks so much for the opportunity to come and talk about it. And it's great to talk next after you, Teen, um, and thank you for your contribution to, to the work we did as part of Project Phoenix. And as a uh, great introduction um, through Teen's talk to to address this bigger question. I mean, we've seen some fantastic case studies all through this session, but I guess now is a good time to say, all right, well, what when we are planning for post-fire recovery, what is the role of seed in this in this whole process? And as Tina's um, quite um, rightly said, it's you know it's, it really needs to be a stop and check approach to that, um, given it's such a precious resource. So I'll be talking today about some of the models we might use to sort of understand how we how we combine our understanding of fire ecology and restoration to get the best outcomes post fire. So as we've talked about, I mean, what a fantastic set of speakers we've had today so far and to come as well to think about uh, the lessons we've learned and our responses to, to fire. And I mean, it's a really important point that's come up time and time again here that, you know, wildfire is not necessarily all damaging. And what we've seen as a response to these fires is incredible resilience and regeneration in these systems. So we don't really need to to rush in straight away um, in terms of these systems, especially, especially for systems, of course, that have evolved in fire prone landscapes as has been identified you know there are vegetation communities that are not fire prone we're talking about our rainforests and our alpine that are not don't have those adaptations but a lot of the systems in Australia do so if we sort of took our understanding of fire ecology then how can what can restoration um, ecology bring to our understanding of these systems and where they where they're at so we know that when we're approaching restoration we can involve a range of approaches through from natural regeneration which is essentially just protecting it and letting it come back on its own through to seed introduction so if we stood back and had a look at all of the different vegetation communities that were that were burnt during the black summer fires we can really ask ourselves what is the role of seed in post-fire recovery um, can restoration strategies be used selectively to facilitate the recovery that's there? And how do we actually predict or can we predict um, when intervention is important and when it's required and, what, and when it's going to lead to better outcomes? So when we're assessing the need for intervention, I mean, we've all probably had very lived experience of, of trying to work in uh, with limited resources. And so this is sort of this ecological triage approach. It's like, we've got a big problems, many, many problems. How do we allocate our resources accordingly? And that's not just the resources to do the work on the ground. When we're talking about seed, seed is incredibly short supply, native seed. We know that our seed supply chains are not there. So we really need to make sure that what we are doing is we're using a very precious resource, very selectively and very effectively. So what we need is a, is a framework really to um, assess the need for intervention based on a number of factors. And, and this is sort of links in very nicely to what, what Tony and Mark were introduced earlier about the factors that can drive how a community, vegetation community responds to fire. So basically the first of those is that what was the condition of the vegetation even before that disturbance event came in? And then we can think about the fire severity of, of that, that fire event. 
where it's actually placed in the landscape, so it's landscape context, and then of course going into what is the composition of those communities. So what we sort of set out to do as Project Phoenix is to try and combine these things together to think about where we might need to intervene, where seed might be necessary, or other processes in a restoration might be more effective in getting response and positive responses to fire. So when we're thinking about that, we wanted to approach this as sort of Teen was outlining, what we what really need to do is we need to be able to tap into that regenerative capacity that is already in that system. So obviously systems that have evolved in response to being able to come back from fires, but also other, other disturbance events like, like floods as too. So we've got this regenerative capacity that sits there, but the type of community and what that is involves, like what does that community consist of? So we need to think about the species that are within those communities and their fire response. And this has sort of come up with previous speakers who have spoken about the importance of understanding individual species fire responses. Is it an obligate cedar that's killed by fire, comes back from seed? Is a facultative cedar so it can come back from seed or do some resprouting or is it fully a resprouter having this information of the species in a community is a really important predictor of where and when we might need to intervene but of course as which has come out in a number of talks already today that there are lots of variables that might reduce this regenerative capacity so in an ideal world when things are great the capacity might be there, but we know we don't live in anywhere near an ideal world. And so what we have is we have inappropriate fire regimes. So something about the, the fire frequency, time since last fire can reduce the regenerative capacity, drought, herbivory, we've spoken about, um, we've heard about disease today as well, competition from weeds, grazing pressure, which might selectively take out particular species or have already depleted those resources that are there to, for a disturbance event, being a small and isolated population and habitat modification. These are all the things that can reduce the capacity of a system to come back after disturbance. So if we sort of thought about restoration and what this could bring to the table of how we make decisions about when and how to intervene. So we've got um, a spectrum of degradation. So from very low to high. So, and this is where we have an, a different need for seed depending on where you fall on that degradation spectrum. So this is sort of the principles that Teen was outlining in that, that illustrative figure as well, that this can vary, this degradation spectrum can vary across different communities and within a community varies across space as Teen was talking about from a very intact core area through to where you might get more degradation towards the edge to where you've actually got a completely cleared area adjoining that excuse me so in the low side you basically have low degradation or damage so you basically just need to protect it leave it alone it'll be fine then you work in go move up to facilitated regeneration and this involves maybe going in and doing some targeted weed removal or other management intervention to unlock that that regenerative potential if you're moving up the degradation spectrum you might think okay well we will do that facilitated regeneration but we might need to do some selective reintroduction basically of these non-regenerating groups because of all of those factors that have been contributed to them not regenerating that system and in the context of fire, we're very rarely thinking about having to do complete reconstruction. But what we might think about restoration bringing to the table is, is being able to restore on those edges. So maybe creating a vegetation buffer, increasing patch size, making some insurance populations or increasing connectivity. That's the way that sort of the full reconstruction could bring to this. So as Teen was outlining too, we would be advocating for a very staged approach. So a look. So if a fire event comes through, first of all, assess what you've got and think about, have check what's coming back up and do some facilitated regeneration after that and then move on and do that first before we think about moving up into that combined regeneration reintroduction. But having this gives us a framework to try and understand, well, where are we starting? Where is our starting point and where should we go? So what we tried to do with the spatial model is that, of course, we had places burning all over Australia, different vegetation communities. We thought, can we bring together a framework and parts of the data that might at least give us some ideas about um, where we might need to intervene, how we would intervene, and for what species we might need to intervene. So what we did is we tried to use, we used spatial GIS-based models to think about the fire frequency data that we had. So number of fires, time since last fire, fire intervals, drought conditions leading up to the 2019, 2020 fires, how degraded that habitat is. And so we had a framework for sort of think about the importance of great 
grazing versus not and how that might respond. Um, connectivity as well into that equation and also thinking about distance to cleared areas here, using that as a bit of a proxy for weed load um, and propagule pressure. And then of course, disease for those communities that are suffering from the very real pressures of disease. And all these things contribute to coming up with sort of at least an indication of where a community might sit in that recovery potential. So that's even like before the fire comes through. And then we had some data on that the fire event through, and we'd looked about well, what was the intensity of the fire, that fire event. And of course, this is where our spatial model could stop and has a bit of, um, has at least have some predictive power. And then what's required after this is a bit of an assessment of going out as those case studies have really nicely illustrated, what is the level of regeneration in these systems? Are there missing species or functional groups? Um, are they likely to respond to facilitate a regeneration? So if we selectively took out these weeds, would suddenly we start to see the natives pop up? This is the kind of assessment that's required um, on ground to do that. And from that information, then you can say, well, what should we do? Should we just protect this, protect it from other threats, leave it alone? Should we get in there and do any facilitated regeneration? Or can we do we need any kind of seed inputs once we've seen what facilitated regeneration can do first? So I just wanted to take you through just one example. So we did this analysis for the 19 threatened ecological communities that were burnt more than 10% in the Black Summer fires. So we've got some we've got some illustration case studies, everything from the Stirling Ranges right over to the wet sclerophyll in um, Sydney Basin. So that's this is just one of the illustrations I'm going to show you today, where we tried to combine what we know from fire ecology with restoration to try and understand where we might need to intervene. So if you look at these very colourful diagrams here, these are our double donuts. So what we did for each community is we said, okay, well, inside is our different life forms. So whether this is trying to take a snapshot of this particular community and knowing these communities, I think as, as Mark was pointing out before, they, they vary in space. So even for this, they go, you grade from sort of wetter to drier areas, but on the whole, what is what proportion is herbaceous, shrubs, trees, or climbers and vines? Of those different life forms, what is the different fire responses? How what proportion are re-sprouters, obligate cedars, facultative cedars, or we just don't know. And this can kind of give a bit of a picture about which species we might think might be winners or losers, knowing what we know about how that site the history of the site up until that time and the potential composition that's there. So what we did this is we tried to take this information and get as much data as we could uh, possible at the time to think about, well, what has been in that particular location? What's been the fire frequency? Has it been appropriate or inappropriate based on both national data and some of the, the finer scale state data available? What was the drought conditions leading up to that fire event? And where does it sit in the landscape? How close is it to cleared areas which are likely to be a source of weeds coming into that system? And give it a little bit of an assessment of what, where we think it might sit on that recovery potential. But then we went to look back to plant traits. I mean, I'm a big advocate of plant traits as lots of people are um, who've been presenting today and, and people who are in the, in the audience as well. So they're really, really informative for how we think plants might respond. So what we did is we tried to look, okay, well, what do we know about the primary juvenile period for obligate cedars and facultative cedars in this system? And how does that actually break down for the different life forms? So whether you're herbaceous or you're a shrub or you're a tree, you have a different primary juvenile periods to just to try and us to understand what parts of that community are probably going to bounce back fine or which ones might need intervention if the fire frequency has just been too much um, before leading up to and then ending with this fire event for there to be a seed bank there for them to come back from. So we tried to bring all of this into sort of a spatial context to at least have an estimate of well, what would be our most priority areas. So we did this across all the different TECs that we have. And so the highest priority areas are the ones that probably need the most help according to the factors that we considered in our model. So we were thinking maybe these are the ones you would go first for assessment. So these might be our highest priority. Let's go in there and see, do those on ground assessments and see what's regenerating or not. And there might be plenty of areas that we go, no, they're probably fine if we just protected them and we'll use our resources in the areas that might be no, knowing that a lot of those variables do, do change with space and we had limited resources available. So this is where we need that these site assessments are really key and some of the things that, you know, the resources, Ruby, that you were displaying there would be really key to going in and understanding what's coming up and how do we identify that, which species are there, which species are not, um, are there any missing obligate cedars, and then trying to assign where we might protect 
where we might do facilitated regeneration and where we might might need to add some seed, but until you've given it time to respond to those early interventions, we would actually hold off on that too. And so this would be really great to have some sort of data out there. We can actually sort of test these models and see how well, how close do they get it? Do they get it right in terms of what's happened? And I don't want you to look at any of the details for these specifically, but probably just the colours of the double donuts, to be honest, because I wanted just, just to illustrate that we tried to apply just a general framework that can that's applicable if you're a lowland rainforest or you're a montane heath and thicket or you're a grassy woodland in terms of understanding what's the structure of this community, what kind of profile do we have in terms of fire response, what's the distribution of primary juvenile periods and what might we think might be the threats and risks. So I guess what we can see with using these models and where we think they need to be tested, but they also enable us, hopefully, as it can be some predictive tools just to give some indications about where resources and seed might be, be needed. So it enable us to look backwards, to sort of think about well, how might we respond to events that have happened um, and also to try and look forward though. So if uh, we know we have a very narrow window to make the those most opportunities of, of fire after, after a fire. So this could actually help us identify well, where would we need to intervene quickly to, to get in and try and get on top of those weeds so that it unlocks that potential. And so tracking recovery from previous fire events. But I think the most important thing we want to see through if these models have tested and they're useful to provide a framework is we maybe want to use this to look forward. So we know we're potentially coming up to another bad fire season. So how can we actually predict the communities that are really vulnerable to future fire events? So you might be, again, identifying potential seed needs so that you could do strategic seed collections in advance. You say, okay, if another fire went through in this area, these couple of species are likely to suffer. So maybe we can go and do collections in a sustainable and of course, ecologically sensitive way and biobank those for the future and predict where you might move first if another fire came through to get the weeds under control to unlock that regenerative potential that's already there. So this is the thing that we'd just really love to sort of use this and, and combine it with um, data that's on the ground to try and understand how what tools are there and how we may make decisions to, to get the most out of the regenerative potential that sits in these systems and only intervene particularly with seed where, where required. Thanks very much, Melinda, for those great resources. I've popped um, the Project Phoenix resources in the chat as well if anyone wants to have a bit further reading. Um, now, we are quite over time. I'm very sorry for all of that. Uh, if anyone has any questions that they want to pop in the chat, maybe do it now. I don't think we've got any pressing Joe questions. I didn't see any come through. Uh, not a lot yet, no. It's okay. Jeff some has them, answered. Yep. Yeah, some of them have been answered. Like Jeff has answered one about identifying myrtle rust. Yeah. And that's it, really. I think that's fine. I think they're really, really good resources. Um, I've popped the links to Jeff, your Myrtle Rust videos, Melinda Grinning, Australia Teen, uh, Fab and Ruby, your seed library on our naturalists. They're all in the chat. Um, thank you everyone for that session. I really appreciated the different thoughts and how we can be approaching things and looking forward in the future. Our final session is going to also be about how we can be better planned for the future uh, and also what we have learnt from the last couple of years. I might just start rolling on that just because I'm aware of the time and that people have public transport to get to. Um, our first speaker for this session is Tom LeBreton. Tom is undertaking a PhD but also recently undertook the mammoth task of leading listing advice for species most impacted by the fires. Um, Tom, I will get you to jump on when you can. I think he's, yes, he's here. Um, very good. Yep, and I'll get you to share your screen if you can.
just got to remember how to use Zoom. Um, <laughs> yes, sorry. It's always Teams, isn't it? And now we're yeah. throwing Zoom at you. What am I doing with my life? Yep. Very good. All Thank right. Can everybody see that? Yes, we got you. Thanks for that, Sean. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, what we did uh, in terms of assessing plants and some of the lessons we learned from it. Um, and I just want to acknowledge the Gadigal people on whose land I'm presenting today and all the dozens or hundreds of traditional owners' lands whose uh, traditional owners of the lands whose uh, who we worked across uh, during this project. Um, so all this work came out of the Species Expert Assessment Plan, which I'll just refer to as the SEED project as we go along. Um, this was the Commonwealth's response to assessing the status of biodiversity impacted by the 2019-20 fires. And our group at UNSW did the um, assessments for a bunch of the plants from the national prioritisation effort. In terms of the structure, I'm going to give a quick bit of background on um, all of that and then the methods, results, uh, some broad trends, uh, along with some examples, and then I'll get into the lessons learned. So as Tony was telling us earlier, when the fires happened, given their scale, it became apparent that a framework to identify species most likely to be negatively impacted by the fires was needed. He led the development of that framework, and it was included in the National Prioritisation Report by Rachel Gallagher, uh, which identified 486 species for urgent action and assessment. These were identified based on a combination of range burnt, listing status, and the framework. Um, and following this, the SEAT project tasked us with assessing 135 of these species out of a long list of 250 or so, which we further prioritised using rapid assessments. Um, so these rapid assessments were conducted based on a modified version of the IUCN Red List criteria. We had two passes. The first excluded sub-criteria and the second includes some of the sub-criteria and both of them assumed continuing declines due to the fires. Uh, we then got onto the full assessment. So these were uh, fully com uh, compliant with the EPBC, uh, IUCN and common assessment methodology. We gathered a ton of data from people that had been working on all of these species uh, before and after the fires. We did a lot of data cleaning of spatial data consulted with Indigenous communities over cultural significance. And where we had money and time, we also conducted some extra surveys for data deficient species. And then finally, the assessments were reviewed by the Commonwealth Assessment Group and prioritised to be sent on to the Threatened Species Scientific Committee for listing. Uh, so in the end, we completed 118 assessments out of the 135 because a few of the species were either a bit taxonomically uncertain or we didn't have enough data to complete them in time. Um, so on the right here, you can see how things shook out in terms of threat status. Most species were either endangered or critically endangered, uh, plus a few came out as vulnerable, and some of the species were found to not be threatened at all. Uh, 91 of these species had never been listed before, um, so were completely new listings, and 20 already listed species were found to be at a higher risk of extinction than previously thought, plus there was one species that was downgraded from endangered to vulnerable. Um, so in terms of the rapid assessments and how accurate they were uh, in terms of predicting the final assessment, um, the overall, overall accuracy uh, you can see in black on that figure on the right there was 59%, um, and critically endangered species had the highest accuracy at about 64%. Most of the changes in status between the rapid assessments and the full assessments were cases where species moved to a higher threat status. Um, and I just wanted to highlight this because considering that these assessments are conducted quite quickly and on limited information, an accuracy of 59% is quite high. And I think it's got a lot of potential for speeding up um, future assessment processes. Um, so some of the trends we observed among the species were pretty interesting. The first one was that almost all the species occurred primarily in protected areas. So this is partly to be expected because it was driven by the um, the fires, which obviously obviously burnt through forested areas, but I think it shows how um, even species that are well represented in reserves are still at risk of extinction. Um, the second major point was that the fires themselves, as a single season or event, were not the major threat to species. The larger threat related to fire was around altered fire regimes, uh, for example, more frequent fire. Um, and climate change was also found to be interacting with or making almost all threats worse now and in the near future. Um, and lastly, overall, the worst impacts were observed when the 2019, uh, when the fires interacted with the existing threats like drought and disease. Um, so for some of these case studies, just looking at some of the interactions, the first one's drought interactions. And we've got Hakea diherdii here, which was assessed as critically endangered. Um, it occurs mostly in dry sclerophyll forests in Kanangaboid National Park in the south uh, southern part of the Blue Mountains. 
Um, and during the drought that led into the fires, the population was severely impacted, it had high adult mortality, um, and that resulted in the opening of the seed follicles and a recruitment event. Um, then when the 2019-20 fires came through, all the new recruits were killed wherever they were burnt, and many of the surviving adults were killed, um, plus their seed banks were consumed by the high severity fires. Um, so overall, we estimated a decline of 50 to 85% for this species. And this is a good example of um, where the species probably would have been fine dealing with just drought or just fire, um, but the two together really knocked it about. Uh, the second case study is looking at weed interactions. So we've got Berseria calcicola here, another critically endangered species. This one's restricted to Wombian Caves Reserve in New South Wales and has one population with about seven patches. Uh, when the fires came through here, most of the plants were burnt but were able to re-sprout, um, but there was no recruitment observed. The big negative in this case uh, in terms of the fires was facilitating severe weed encroachment um, to the point where weeds were smothering some of the patches entirely. Um, and lastly, we've got a case study about altered fire regimes. Um, so this species, Nematolepis ritidophila, um, another critically endangered species restricted to a small area of the Southeast Forest uh, National Park in New South Wales. It's got four populations and in 2015, two of the four were burnt during a HR, uh, hazard reduction burn, um, but they had healthy post-fire flash of recruitment. So no real problems there, but when the 2019-20 fires came along less than five years later, um, it burnt all four populations and the one population that had been long unburnt had something like 800 seedlings come up while the two populations burned in 2015 uh, lost a bunch of the newer recruits and they also had much lower recruitment due to a diminished seed bank from the two fires in quick succession. So the main thing from these um, examples is just to note that the fires in and of themselves weren't really much more than most fire adapted species could tolerate. The real issue was that the interactions uh, with the many other threats uh, these species were facing undermine their resilience. So following on from that, I just want to talk about some of the positives that came out of the fires. Um, and this kind of links back to my last point, which is that for some species, these fires were not only not bad, but they were actually good for the species. Um, so neither of these species are actually seep species, but they've just been in the news around the place. Um, they're both critically endangered. Um, and one, Plinthanthesis rodway had what was thought to be an extinct population rediscovered just recently, uh, while the other, Gentiana bradboensis, uh, had the first major recruitment event in about 20 years. Um, and in both cases, this was because their habitats had been long unburnt and had become unsuitable in the absence of fire. Some of the other positives were the fact that there's now a lot more data available than ever before. Um, projects like Saving Our Species, the Big Bushfire Bioblitz and others um, have really contributed to this. And then resources like the Atlas of Living Australia, um, Austrates and others are also all getting bigger and improving all the time. Uh, the other thing that was really heartening to see was just how many um, passionate people are invested in plant conservation all over the country. Uh, so onto the lessons learned. Uh, one of the big ones was knowledge gaps. Um, so despite this increased availability of data, there's still massive gaps uh, for taxonomic and functional groups that are understudied. Some of these are cryptic or taxonomically unstable species like herbertia and orchids. Um, others are difficult to study like parasites, epiphytes and cliff species. Uh, then there are also geographic biases, so arid and semi-arid regions being an obvious one. But a lot of the more remote forested areas have quite poor ecological data about the species that occur there. Um, and lastly, data quality, availability and access. Even though there's been large improvements, um, there's still a long way to go. And I think further improvements can be made, uh, particularly around access through standardising reporting requirements and providing written agreements about how data can, can and can't be used when it's shared. Um, we also learn a lot about threats. Uh, so by far the biggest and most consistent threat across all species was climate change. The effects were often indirect, but it kept cropping up as a major factor driving or exacerbating threats now and into the future. Um, climate action is needed, as a few of the presenters have said, to um, prevent this from worsening. Um, and for other threats, there's a general need to increase both resourcing and threat management, uh, resourcing of threat management actions and to implement and enforce policy mechanisms that uh, prevent things like clearing of threatened species or their habitats. Um, another big lesson learned was that we're still far from having comprehensive threatened species lists for plants. So you can see on that figure on the right there um, that plants are really lagging behind uh, birds and mammals for the EPBC Act. Um, 
And for a starting point for this, many of the species prioritised after fire are still waiting for assessments and require funding to get those done. Uh, but one of the good things that the SEEK project has shown is that it's possible to assess a lot of species quite quickly, given adequate funding. Uh, but overall, there's still an urgent need uh, for, for a strategic plan and funding to make plan listings comprehensive. Uh, following on from that, we learned some things that can help when it comes to planning for the future. So firstly, the prioritisation framework has scope to be applied preemptively to identify species most likely to be threatened by future megafires. Uh, this can enable proactive conservation measures and rapid response after the fire. We also had some insights into how assessment processes can be uh, made more efficient as well. Um, specifically, a combination of regional and taxonomic approaches that allows assessors to become more familiar with the issues specific to a taxonal region quirks of ecology and stuff like that. Um, and it also makes it easier to build relationships with uh, people like regional experts, park rangers, stakeholders and indigenous groups that might all feel more comfortable with a familiar face rather than um, having to build a relationship with a new one every time a new species gets assessed in the region. Um, so to wrap up, I just wanted to highlight a few key takeaways. The first two uh, being that species can cope with extreme fire events if they haven't had their resilience undermined by other threats. Um, and in the same vein, fire itself is not bad for most species, at least fire adapted ones, um, and it can even be a positive. Many more species are likely to be at risk of extinction um, than we currently know, which is not great, but we do have the capacity to identify them. Um, we also have uh, threat management, which needs better resourcing and enforcement. Um, and lastly, uh, there's still time to address climate change and improve the chances of species uh, surviving in the future. Um, so thanks again um, to all the collaborators and yeah, thanks for that, Sean. Thanks very much, Tom. I think we're seeing through a lot of these talks that it's it's the multi-threat theme that's uh, um, impacting our plants. Um, next, we're going to talk about people, actually. Damien Wrigley is going to give us a little bit overview about what he learnt about the importance of people in reacting to extreme events. Uh, Damien's from the Botanic Gardens, by the way. Thank you, Damien. Thanks, Sean. I'm just trying to share it. Don't know if it's going to let me. They're tricky, aren't they? They are. Do you want to maybe jump to the next one and I'll see if yeah. I can Yeah, we'll go it. to Belinda. Are you okay to go, Belinda Kenny? How are you going? Just give me a second. No worries. And if that doesn't work, we'll go to Rachel. Oh, yeah, Belinda's on. So Belinda's from Hotspots, uh, which has already been mentioned. And this is a little example of what you can be doing uh, on your own properties. Thank you. Thanks, Chantel. Um, so Hotspots Fire Project is a partnership between the New South Wales Nature Conservation Council and the New South Wales Rural Fire Service. We have a whole bunch of other partners and for each workshop, we locally bring along representatives from those agencies that are uh, relevant in that community, as well as local Indigenous groups and local environment groups. So we try and get as many different uh, agencies involved as possible so that the community we're working with has access to all sorts of different people and experience. So what do we actually do? We're looking at providing education uh, information to rural landholders and it's very much about how do they do fire management on their properties that balances biodiversity conservation with protecting life and property so what are the balances between that and how do we teach people how to go about that so each workshop consists of two full day workshops and they're usually a few weeks apart at the um first workshop we talk about uh, fire risk fire regimes and fire ecology so we run through the basics of fire ecology with people so they understand both animal and plant responses to fire and how those things are used to put together fire interval guidelines um, and threat and species management uh, guidelines for fire management and why those things matter and how they can apply those locally and give them some information about what veg, what threatened species are they likely to have on their block and how do they look after them. And then we go through helping them develop a fire management plan. So each property gets given a big laminated map 
of their property. And on those maps, they go through and mark out where are their assets, where's their vegetation, what's the fire history in the past, and then really think about well, what does that mean in terms of management zones on that block and therefore management priorities and actions. Then at workshop two, we go to one of those properties and we get really practical. So we look at how do we talk about fire behavior and the elements that make that up. So fire weather and fire and fuel. Um, and we look at how do you prepare for a burn. So we do things like um, identifying trees that either because of bark hazard or habitat values need to be protected from that fire. And we do things like uh, removing the fuel from around those so that they don't burn. And then the most important thing we do at that second workshop is we conduct a small hazard reduction. Um, it's a small burn. It's a low intensity burn. It's very much about showing people the size of the burn that they can conduct and control safely by themselves. Um, and it's also very much about reducing the fear of fire. So making it uh, approachable um, and yeah, really getting people to be comfortable with how to apply fire. And we go through a lot of the rules and things that they need to do in order to be able to do that themselves. Um, so that's a really brief, brief overview of what we do. Um, the program has been running for 15 years. In that time, there's been over 150 workshops throughout New South Wales. All those blue dots on the map there are the workshops that we've done. In that, over those workshops, we've engaged with two and a half thousand landholders and produced um, 1,400 fire management plans. Now, while each each workshop seems fairly small scale. We're working with a really specific community and a handful of property owners. Um, all of that private land, that we've produced fire management plans over time for 300,000 hectares of land, of private land that is considering conservation in their fire management plan. So it's actually, when you add it all up, really a significant program. The program is most specifically targeted at that preparation phase. So teaching people how to prepare for fire, how to manage fire, to connect communities um, and help them be more resilient through a fire. But we have had pro, um, workshops that are very specifically targeted at post-fire uh, recovery. On the map, I've circled a few of them in red and they're ones that we did specifically as post-fire recovery workshops prior to 2019 and that QR code hopefully will take you to some information specifically about those particular workshops and then obviously since 2020 we've done workshops again in areas that have been impacted by those fires and they're the ones circled in yellow um, and we've revisited a couple of um, previous workshops as sites as well to do things like help with erosion control and putting up nest boxes and we have the large forest owls project in the Richmond Clarence region which is looking really specifically at recovery of owls in that, that area. Um, and yeah thanks to Mercedes for her brief intro um, earlier today. Um, some of the things that we found from I guess talking to people at, uh, in those specific recovery workshops is that those that have been impacted by fire actually have more of a concern about the environmental impacts compared to just the, um, I guess, the protecting their property and their assets in the first place. So those that have been impacted are then really focused on uh, what's the environmental impact and, and how do I help that recover? So that's a brief overview. Thank you all. Thanks very much, Belinda. Um, there was someone about Hotspot's questions earlier on in the day. I don't know if you were, saw that question. I did, and I don't have a specific answer for that, for work that NCC has specifically done about that issue. But I'm, I'm sure somebody must have, if there must be some more general research out there about people's uh, increased interest in, in how do I deal with climate change myself now that, that it's so obvious yeah there's got to be stuff out there not something we've specifically done with this project thank you for your time thank you uh, 
Damien, we might jump back to you now if you think you're okay to go. Sure, I've given it a go. Given it a go. If it's going to work, I've tried to send oh. my uh, presentation onto Joe, so my apologies. No worries, that's fine. Doesn't seem to like me. Oh no, Damien. Do you want to jump to the next one? I'll come back. Yeah. Um, we might go to Professor Rachel Gallagher's, Associate Professor Rachel Gallagher's talk. Um, Richie, that's for you there. If Richie can jump on. Yes, very good. So uh, this is part of the response to the 1925s. The New South Wales Bushfire and Natural Hazards Research Centre was established. Um, Rachel is leading one of the six partner universities and she's working on the environment node. So she's just done a little five minute introduction of what the environment node is going to be doing. Research Centre, which is a consortium of different universities led by Western Sydney, uh, which is shown along the bottom of the slide here. And I'll take you through some of the reasons for the formation for the, of the centre uh, and what we plan to do within what we call the environment node of the centre. So thanks for joining me. So we've talked a lot today. Uh, about the situation with the 2019-20 fires across the landscape. So both within New South Wales, where most of the fire impact um, occurred, but also across the broader continent. And of course, the way that these fires interacted with previous fires across the range, the potential for future fires, the severity of those fires, and also interacting with other threats, including interesting work on metal rust from, from Jeff Pegg uh, and also other diseases, pathogens, uh, and factors such as feral herbivory. So I'm a plant ecologist, so I'll be talking primarily from the plant's perspective, uh, but of course we had fire far and wide-ranging impacts on species across the environment. So you will have seen images like these throughout the day as well. And if you haven't seen them, you would certainly live them during 2019-20. And I think we've all got a sense of dread about the uh, brewing El Nino system, that, uh, uh, the brewing El Nino um, that's coming over the next summer. And we really need to start thinking and planning about how we're going to respond to those next big fire events, which are certainly on the horizon. Uh, so in 2019, uh, in 2020, sorry, um, New South Wales government launched a bushfire inquiry. Uh, and there's an infographic provided on the right here that just kind of takes you through the main findings of that um, inquiry. And I'm sure people are very familiar with, with this and have had a chance to have a bit of a read of the inquiry. Um, there were 76 recommendations, all which were adopted from the final report. But recommendation five was this one, that the government established New South Wales as a major world centre of bushfire research and technology development and commercialisation. So part of that was to, do, was to develop and fund a bushfire and natural hazards research centre. And that's what we are. So we are a nine and a half million dollar New South Wales government, government investment between 2023 and 2027. Uh, we are a collection of six different universities, as I said earlier, which are listed here. Uh, and we are working across a range of different programs. So many of you will be familiar with the previous New South Wales Bushfire Risk Management Research Hub. And so I've popped in the members um, and research providers from the previous hub, which are included in our new centre. And then the kind of new recruits that we have on the right here, um, which have a range of different styles of expertise, um, ranging from uh, understanding the impacts of flooding, changes of climate regimes, ecosystem modelling, indigenous engagement, atmospheric smoke uh, impacts, but also very importantly, a few faces in here, the work that they do is about socioeconomic um, and social systems research which will allow us to better understand how to get the information and research that we have into the hands of people who need it on the ground. The research centre is structured around six different nodes, with a seventh that has been added around flooding and climate, uh, will be added around flooding and climate impacts. Um, our different nodes <coughs> include things about prevention and preparedness, how to work with community uh, operations, but um, 
um, what the, the area that's most important for ANCC and all the people on this on this webinar is the Environment Node. So I'm the co-leader of the Environment Node with David Keith and Mark Uwe at uh, UNSW. Uh, we are uh, wrapped up around our, our approach to the uh, research centre is Indigenous engagement and Indigenous knowledge and we have an Indigenous advisory board uh, and connections that we are making to people who are on country who can teach us um, where culturally appropriate how fires can be better managed across the state. Um, so there's a range of uh, different inquiry recommendations that will be addressed by the Natural Hazards Research Centre, things like enhancing remote sensing technology for ignition detection, um, using different kinds of remote sensing um, tools, uh, thinking about quantifying bushfire risk and residual risk um, and how we can understand that from a research perspective, including hazard reduction burning, and then acknowledging cultural burning as an important part of landscape management and getting in and working with the cultural science teams across a range of different agencies who are involved in funding and, uh, and uh, collaborating on the research centre. Um, and then finally looking at vegetation burn impulse and changes across the environment. So we have a co-design model. Uh, we're really interested in sitting down with the people uh, who are managing fires on the ground and understanding what research needs they actually have to be able to manage those fires better. Uh, and we go about this, uh, and this first year of the centre has really been about planning out themes and working groups and project ideas, um, and which will go as a portfolio of ideas up to the uh, steering committee in, in late December. So I hope that gives you a little bit of background. If you'd like to hear more, please reach out to our centre director, who's Professor Matthias Bohr uh, at Western Sydney University. Thanks a lot, everyone. I say thanks, Rachel. Um, you can get in contact with Rachel as well if you've got questions about that. Damien is ready to go. Thank you so much, Damien. I'm looking forward to this one. Can you see that? Excellent. What a way to build uh, the suspense for a rapid fire talk. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Damien Wrigley, the Manager of Living Collections and Conservation at Botanic Gardens of Sydney. And I'm here to talk to you about my experience uh, leading the Australian Civil Partnership during the bushfire response. So just quickly, there's a bit of an outline of what I'll be covering. I'm going to be doing it as fast as I can. So hopefully if you don't catch everything, it's in the recording and you can pick that up on the website afterwards. So really for us, what was the key for our response was the established relationships that the partnership had over 20 years of the Council of Heads of Australian Botanic Gardens and the CPAC partnership working together. It meant that we were able to establish what our capabilities and capacities were. Um, it also meant that we could be as flexible as possible to respond as things changed along the way and to identify the redundancies in the, in the network and how we might be able to support those um, through other partners across the country. Um, in order for it to be as effective as possible, these kinds of established relationships, pretend, uh, particularly when they're geographically dispersed, it's the trust that you build amongst each other and all the things that are layered underneath that trust are so the communication, the transparency, um, the, the other elements that come in to build that trust over time. And I think that's what builds the confidence within the network to know that what you're able to actually deliver but then also bring that confidence in from the outside um, that others that are funding you, the others that are working with you, that they have confidence in what it is that you're actually able to deliver as well. Uh, so I like to kind of think that we had a bit of a proactive response to the fires. So what we did was we took what we'd learnt over 10, 20 years as a partnership, and we were able to use that to put the processes and systems that we already had in place to work. We were able to, like I said, use those capabilities and capacities and identify what those were really, really quickly but also identify what our priorities were as a partnership and as seed banks around the country and the other partners and networks that worked with us and be able to communicate those with the funders, with the stakeholders and with the people that we were working with to inform their policies and programs, but also how we're actually going to implement the work on the ground. Um, that meant that we could use all of that to respond in time to the disaster that was the bushfire, but also respond through time. So as things changed as the disaster response, as the fire response was rolled out, we could adapt um, as those things changed in, in front of us. Um, but also it's really important that no matter how proactive you are, no matter how prepared you are, you've got to be ready to be reactive as well. To do it, I firmly believe that we've got to respect the diversity, not just what we're working with, and we all respect the diversity in our flora, we're all well aware of it, but respect that diversity within our teams. Um, the partnership really is um, 
quite heavily focused um, through white men, but there is still diversity within that. There's still a diversity of experiences and skills. There's a diversity of facilities, um, operating environments and priorities that happen um, to exist because of the different jurisdictions that we're all operating in. So just being cognizant of those diversities and respectful of it and working with that is really important. Um, I really can't stress enough how important it is to take the time to know and understand each other, what your priorities are, what you're working with. Um, take the time to go visit each other, not just at a conference and talking at you know lunch and morning teas, but spending time with others' facilities, spending time understanding the, um, the world that they're working in, what they're operating in, and respecting that because it's important to know and understand that too. Make as many allowances for that diversity as you can and um, understand how that can provide, provide strength to what you're trying to do. For us, local, national, global made a huge difference. We were able to bring in three and a half million dollars for seed um, conservation work over the bushfire response. Um, we knew what we had to work with, um, but also we backed our experts um, and hats off to the experts around the country like Rachel Gallagher and the bushfire um, expert panel that was convened by the Commonwealth Government. They listened to what our experts were saying and they were allowing us to bring in some of our regional priorities at the local level to inform and deliver against the national priorities as well so that we got that sort of double bang for the buck. Um, it does take the long-term effort to build those relationships, not just with your partners and your local experts, but those people that are funding you as well. Um, and really do not underestimate the potential for those opportunities that come from left field. We had requests and um, offers of funding and seed and all sorts of things coming in from all over the world. Um, so it's being ready to understand which of those are actually going to work for you and being able to put your hand up and, and jump on board with those when they come. Uh, obviously, we're all aware of the compounding disasters that came after the bushfires. COVID made everything infinitely more difficult. We also were dealing with floods when it came to the collecting, but also metal rust as well. So being cognizant of the fact that your network might be strong, it might be robust and resilient and doing an incredible job, but all these other things add to the complexity that they're dealing with as a professional and as a personal, uh, as an individual. Um, so keep up the communication, give people time and communicate what that need is both to each other and to your funders. Um, be understanding about it. Um, be understanding about all those pressures that come onto someone from all these different areas. But the biggest thing for me was also finding the joy in what you're doing. Just, you know, celebrate those little wins, celebrate the big ones and make sure that you do take the time to recognise how incredible a job everyone's doing um, just to make sure you stay sane in all of it. It's a huge thing to have to deal with a response like this. Uh, First Nations relationships, we had some really good, um, some strong uh, pieces in our projects for building on relationships we already had, but establishing new ones as well. Things like COVID made it infinitely more impossible for us because we could not go into country and build those relationships. We could not go and build that trust and have that communication in person on country. Um, but we still were able to do some of the things we set out to do. All I can say is recognise and respect consultation fatigue. I know a lot of us are aware of this, but there are a lot of communities out there that have been pushed for input um, left, right and centre. Be realistic about what funding you have and what you can achieve with it. Um, but also understanding the complexity of relationships within First Nations communities and what that relationship then is for us and being, um, being cognizant and acknowledge the impact of trauma since invasion and what that's done and, and we're still operating in a system that was developed post-invasion and the impacts that that has and how complicated that makes it when you're engaging. And I think there's a lot of people doing a lot of great work, but we need to be aware of the system we're operating in and, and what impact that has. Um, the last thing really for me is closing the loop the whole way through. So continuing to communicate with your stakeholders, your funders, your partners, the whole way through to make sure that they're understanding what the benefits are, what the challenges are, limitations, why things might be going off track. Um, don't be afraid to navigate guys at any point, what's working, what's not, and why is that the case? And then what you can do to change things in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Damien. That was very nice to have that refreshing look at ourselves and how we can improve it. Our last two speakers, thank you everyone for your patience. Um, today, our last two speakers I'm really excited about. Andrew Denham is next. Andrew, if you can get ready, that would be great. Andrew is the Senior Research Scientist from the Department of Planning and Environment and is going to be talking about lessons and opportunities that he's learnt over some quite extensive observations of fire impacts. There okay, he here we go. Here we go, right? 
Excellent. Thanks, Sean and, and Joe and ANPC for the opportunity to talk today. Um, and also thanks so much for all the excellent speakers ahead of me. Um, I changed my title from the talk that's uh, advertised because I felt that it was really a bit negative, but really what I want to do is focus more on what we learned from trying to make assessments of, of plant responses after the, the 2019-20 fires, um, rather than complain about the things that didn't work particularly well. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, my co-authors here and there's several others who have been involved in this project over the time. Um, but first I'd like to acknowledge country. Uh, today and most days I work from Darwell country and I would like to uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of this country, but also uh, all the owners and elders past, present and emerging on all the country that, that this work's been done on. <clears throat> okay, so um, essentially there were, there's a bunch of processes, a bunch of steps in understanding post-fire recovery process and our management of um, natural resources and biodiversity. And the, the start of that is the provisional list of species at greatest predicted risk. And we've already had uh, Tony and Tom and uh, I can't even remember all the, all the people have already mentioned this initial step, which is a desktop uh, piece of work, followed then by doing on-ground assessments to establish the actual impacts and and the, uh, the degree of threat that these plant species have been suffering at these sites. Getting some evidence base in order to prioritise uh, management effort and then monitoring that, that management effort to see how effective it's been. And so what I'm going to talk about today was uh, a part of the work that we were funded through the Commonwealth Government to look at 100 species identified uh, in those assessment processes that contribute to some of these, uh, these parts of the scheme. And of course, as was mentioned earlier by other speakers, data about what we had before the fire, about the abundance of species, the threats that were apparent, and the previous fire regime and several other in, uh, inputs contribute to deciding which species were predicted to be at greatest risk. And to close the loop, obviously after these 2019 20 fires and management actions have been taken, we need to be able to provide that data back into a system that allows us to make predictions through the next fire. Okay, so I'm not going to spend much time on this, but because we've already had some uh, introduction to it, but essentially uh, there were two parallel and related reports that identified a large number of significant species, including about 230 species in New South Wales. Um, of those, we were, were given responsibility for doing the survey, the on-ground survey for about 100. And um, this is the geographic scope of our work. So all the yellow dots show where we uh, either did or commissioned surveys or obtain data for other species. And it ranges from the Queensland border down to the Victorian border and, and covers most of the, the areas that were burnt by those 2019 25s. Uh, in terms of conservation status, you can see that um, from our 100 species, a fairly large proportion of them were not listed species. There's a bunch of, of listed species between critical uh, and, and vulnerable. But today I want to focus on just about 40 taxa that were at the time not listed species. So these are ones that presumably were listed, were, were um, identified as at risk partly because we don't know much about them, but also because their known range was essentially burned across their whole um, in those 2019 25s. And I thought when I wrote this talk that it would be pertinent to do a quick uh, fire ecology uh, primer, but that's probably not necessary now given the quality of the presentations that have come in the past. So I'll, I'll go through this very quickly, but a, a simple plant life history, um, there can be four stages. We've got all those different components. If you if you make it a, uh, if you put a fire component in there, there's usually something that changes. And if we choose a, a fire sensitive species with some sort of seed storage, it's that there's a break between the production of seeds and the production of seedlings. So in these systems between fires, uh, seeds are produced, 
but seedlings are not generally don't generally establish. And a fire comes along for this particular species that's a um, not a re-sprouter, all the above ground stuff is likely to be killed, but the seeds are released from dormancy or they're released from capsules on the plant and become seedlings. And then of course, in between fires, essentially rolls back to this same system where seeds no longer um, germinate and the seed bank builds back up again between fires. But the other thing that goes on after any fire event is that there's this interfire inter mortality and you know, that can be affected by uh, other threats like disease and drought, herbivory, a whole lot of things that have already been mentioned. But it's hard to keep those, uh, those components in perspective when you're using uh, prior assessments or observations of species at a site when you come back after a fire, if, it, especially if there's a long gap between when the last observation was and when you come in after the fire. But, but we just need to bear in mind that there are losses in all of these steps um, in between each fire event. So what I did with those 42 species was essentially look at where we had some kind of pre-fire survey data and where we didn't and where we did have the data, whether we had enough information to make a qualitative assessment of what was going on. And essentially, in terms of populations, it was really challenging for us to make any assessments of a decline or no decline. There were some individuals, some species where we found there was enough evidence to say, yes, we think there's a decline, um, and some where we thought probably wasn't a decline, but a lot of them we just couldn't tell. In terms of site occupancy, where a species had been observed as a site prior to the 2019-20 fires, but wasn't observed after, that was a bit easier. We were able to identify several declines in the number of populations that were, and the actual um, site occupancy of some species. And of, of course, both these things contribute to their assessment in terms of um, their threat status. Uh, but of course, there's so much there's so much nuance into understanding what's going on in populations. If you go to a site after a fire and you don't see any plants of that species, does that really mean they're not there? It could just be that you need a bit more time for them to be uh, to emerge from the store seed bank and all the adults are killed. Um, and and the other there's another possibility which is they they were all there after the fire, but some something else has taken place since the fire and before you came to make the observations, and that population is now gone. So there's there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of a lot of things that lead us to be not so sure about what's going on with these species. So uh, just to conclude, for about half the species, we weren't able to assess whether there were population changes, even in a qualitative way, and where we where there was pre-fire data, there are many reasons for us to be cautious about our interpretation of that data. Uh, it was a little bit different for changes in site occupancy, but we still have lots of uncertainty about that. Nevertheless, this was a highly instructive and useful exercise, and it's obviously helpful for planning future monitoring and assessment. And some of the species that I've, that I've sort of summarised here were part of um, the assessments that Tom talked about where listing or, or threat level was increased as a result of these assessments. So I wanted to focus on what we could do better next time. There's lots of things that we can do better. Standardising data collection and data quality would be really good. Even with uh, well-established ecologists collecting data, people don't always collect the data that, that you need for your purpose. And we could probably work together to try and um, reach uh, an understanding about the sort of things that can be useful. So for example, if you're focused on a species and you think all that matters is whether, whether it's there and, and how many seedlings juveniles and adults there are or whether it's flowering, that's great. But if you can extend that to look at the habitat, is there evidence of a recent fire? What's the, what's the habitat structure like? And, and potentially other environmental variables that uh, are really useful things to collect that other people can lean off and, and use for their own assessments. Some of the species were in areas that are very difficult to get to, that you can only walk to, that take a long time to get to. Uh, and so if we can plan field work to these remote locations to, to consider multiple species at the same time, it's really useful. 
Uh, and there are other ways that we can uh, improve efficiency of, of data collection. One of the big things we found was that trying to get data from many different sources and get it all together in a, in a single repository is really challenging and we're still actually working through that ourselves. Uh, I think there's a lot we can do uh, to try and develop more appropriate storage and management structures. And finally, the, the community thing, the human communities are really important and communicating with others doing related work is, is essential to making this all reduce duplication and improve our effectiveness in terms of assessing plants and, and other threats other than fire. Um, and that's it. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, Andrew. Some really good points. And there's a question there for you, actually, as well. If you can have a look, that would be great. Mm, Our final presenter is Dr. Libby. <laughs> um, Libby, thank you for taking the hardest slot of the day. Uh, really appreciate your bravery there. Uh, if anyone has looked at the Megafires book, Libby is one of the editors on that and I'll pop the link in there, but as well as being an editor, she actually specialises in decision-making for conservation. So Libby's going to discuss how improving evidence is required to support our decision-making, not just for plants, but um, as a whole. So thank you for your time. Great. And thanks to everyone for um, for sticking around. Chantal, you can hear me okay? Great. Okay. Thanks for that introduction. Yeah. So, so this talk, I'm really just going to be talking about a lot of the things that everyone's already talked about. That's the um, beauty mm, mm, disadvantage of going last. You want to change your talk, but, but just to talk about, well, how do we deal with some of these uncertainties um, to to improve decision making uh, for next time? Okay. So, uh, how do I go forward? Here we go. So. So uh, there was a question about this earlier from Ian, but we, you know, we do know that events like 1920 are going to continue with greater frequency. And it's it's hard to say exactly, and, and I think everyone synthesised that really well today, the degree to which biodiversity was impacted by those fires because of gaps in knowledge. Now, we also know, and particularly for, for plants, that um, our, our knowledge base is perpetually uneven. But despite that, we have to make urgent decisions uh, across many different species and communities um, in order to prioritise where effort is, is uh you know, is dedicated. Um, but if we don't go somewhere to resolving some of the uncertainties that that cropped up in the in the first instance, we're, we're just going to perpetuate this this uh, this unevenness of um, of our knowledge base. So this this talks really about well, how do we acknowledge and deal with those data gaps um, and and uncertainties to avoid poor uh, decisions. Okay, so I know lots of people have talked through this, but but just to say there are a bunch of different uh, uh, vulnerability assessments that happened uh, after the fires. Each of them followed, um, they were all done slightly differently, but they all had the same elements. You know, it was asking something about um, the population status of the species and its threat status, the extent to which uh, the the habitat uh, uh, was impacted by, by fire, and then uh, something about the traits of, of the species or the ecological community that would indicate its uh, recovery potential. And so that's either in terms of susceptibility to the event um, or, or, the, the, um, or the circumstances or the um, conditions afterwards. So, you know, it's susceptibility to post-fire disturbance. Um, and so that, just to give you a bit of a scale of, uh, of <laughs> how that was done for these different groups, um, and you can see the the important part here is just you know again despite all of these these knowledge gaps it was really how do we assess thousands tens of thousands of species in a really consistent and logical way um, and and so this was the approach that was taken and the and the work that was done by Tony Old and Rachel Gallagher and David um, uh, in terms of thinking about how traits can be used to inform these frameworks was really instrumental in advancing you know say in uh, invertebrates and even framing the, the vertebrates um, vulnerability assessments so you can see how many plants were were 
screened. Um, and, and then underneath, you can sort of see the numbers of, of species and TCs that were pro prioritised for investment um, from the Australian government and, um, and others. Okay, so but but what else? <laughs> you know, uh, there, there's an extra question there, and that was is the species already described? And so we, you know, we know that for fungi in particular, we didn't do one of these. Um, uh, we didn't do. Uh, these assessments for, for fungi, and that was a real problem for invertebrates as well. And so it kind of falls down at the first hurdle. You can't do a vulnerability assessment if you don't know what you're, what you're dealing with. And that sort of raises some other, um, you know, I, I think some of the other types of uncertainties that, that would crop up at different stages, and they were more or less important for those different groups that we were talking about. And so if you think about the different types of data that we're using to input into these vulnerability assessments, you can think about the types of uncertainty that, that we've got. So and they've all got funny names, but you know, there's something about the species already being, you know, not being described. That's called a Linnaean shortfall. There's there's uncertainty about where, you know, the status of the population, and it's you know, it's it's um, threat status, uh, and and that's got another uh, type of of name. Um, we can think about, and you know, lots of people have been talking about. We don't know where the species uh, are exactly either at all or exactly, uh, and that's the Wallace Ian shortfall. The disturbance footprint, I would say we did that pretty well. There wasn't that, you know, of course there's uncertainty about, you know, high and low severity fire, but but we had pretty good, um, I think, uh, you know, enough certainty about where the fire disturbance footprint was. And then when we think about um, the, the traits that indicate susceptibility uh, to fire, um, how species interact with each other and how they interact with the landscape. And so that is with other threats. There's a whole nother bunch of, of different types of shortfalls and, and uncertainties that we can think of. And then <laughs> all of those things, if you consider them all together, then, then you kind of think about, well, wh what about the, the uncertainty about what works best on the ground, like in terms of what actions are most effective? And so then there's that extra level of uncertainty uh, uh, again. And so when you're thinking about different types of decisions, you can think about, well, which of these uncertainties are more important? And if you're trying to do a vulnerability assessment, these, these top sort of three blue boxes are kind of pretty crucial in order to even press go on a, on a vulnerability assessment. If you're thinking about, um, if you're trying to, uh, if you're trying to think about um, what actions are most effective on the ground, of course, you, you're thinking more about the uncertainty sort of type at the bottom. And so in, in thinking about these different uncertainties, it is really important to try and distinguish which of the uncertainties is most important. So classify the uncertainty because that allows us to prioritise um, resolving those knowledge gaps in relation to different types of decisions. And of course, monitoring and review is kind of uh, critical there. So now, yeah, yeah <laughs> shut um, the, the book was mentioned that um, just to say that, that there's a chapter in the book that sort of poses some of these questions and, you know, reviewing the, the different chapters in the book and looking at the different types of uncertainties people mention, it's pretty overwhelming and confronting because actually all of these different types of uncertainties really um, uh, uh, were mentioned in relation to the different types of, of taxa and, and groups that, that we looked at. But the, the thing is, it's like, of course, it's all, you know, you can break it down further and you can break it down into, you know, species, which species have these different types of uncertainties. And, and, and then, um, again, as I said, how does that matter in relation to the decisions? But if I ask, if I ask scientists, they're going to say everything, everything matters. So we do need this really structured framework, I think, to sort of unpack what matters uh, the most. Okay, so... So when I think about uncertainty, I think about this in terms of, well, what, you know, what, what uncertainty are we really trying to avoid? And you can think about this in terms of the vulnerability assessments and directing investment on the ground. And so if I'm thinking about what I assume, I'm making assumptions, um, which we all 
do um, about the state of the world and and um, and you know particularly for things that we don't know much about and then you can think about what the true state of the world is which might be um, you know which is unknown and so if we assume that the species is going to be affected or susceptible to fire um, and and we find out that the true state of the world is that that is true that's that's a true positive and and so we've said yes it's susceptible it's got some investment and and the potential outcome for that is good um, the things that we want to think about is when we we say um, that the species is vulnerable or susceptible to fire but then we go out there and we find out that actually no it's it's not but but the, and that's a type one area. But the potential outcome there is that the action has led to wasted resources. And you know, probably most of the people in this room wouldn't really care about that so much. The thing that we often are trying to avoid in conservation uh, decision making is this one, where we assume that the that the species is not susceptible, and we go out there and we find out that in fact it was susceptible and was damaged um, uh, by the fire. And so that is a type two error. And so, you know, we would have said it's fine, it doesn't get any investment, but actually, you know, there's a chance that it's gone down the um, down the drain. Okay, so when I think about any type of decision, I'm thinking about framing uncertainties in relation to type two errors largely. So you can have a look at, um, you know, at the, at the book, and I'm, I'm drawing on uh, the plants chapter that's in the book, which is uh, you can download for free from the CSIRO website. Um, and so we can see different examples of that in this plants chapter. So for these two species, the vulnerability assessment rating done by Rachel and others said that these things were highly susceptible, that in post-fire surveys says, yes, confirm that. So you know, the outcome for the species isn't great, but in terms of it getting some funding um, for, for management is good. So our evidence base there for decisions, even though you can always make it better, was, was good enough for this decision. We compare that to these other different species here where, um, where we we went out and or they were rated as having been highly susceptible, but the the monitoring um, post fire indicated that there was actually a low impact and that that the potential outcome there, you know, is that yes, some money was spent in going out and, and looking and, and um, potentially acting, but, but perhaps it wasn't as needed and that money could have been spent elsewhere. But our evidence base for decision making is better now. The Metcalf's green hood, we, we, it wasn't, there wasn't a vulnerability. It, it was, you know, it was one of those data deficient species, but, you know, Lachlan Copeland and, and team uh, and uh, with funding went out um, anyway and, and found that actually, yes, it was susceptible to the fires and it was impacted by the fires. So if that hadn't have happened, that is definitely a species that could have uh, missed out and, uh, and suffered as a result. So, so just to just to wrap up, you know the the 2019-20 fires were were catastrophic, but but I think um, they really demonstrated the need to recognise the the major shortcomings in the evidence base, and they provided an opportunity for figuring out how best to deal with those uncertainties. And so particularly for the invertebrates and the plants, there was this recognition of uncertainty, and and that was accounted for. So there's this you know be pre, pre precautionary kind of approach to uncertainty. Um, and they did provide an opportunity to build the evidence base for large components of biodiversity and we need to keep that up but we also need this framework to for because the uncertainties are so huge for thinking about classifying and prioritizing uncertainty but for different types of decisions as well as that continued investment in long-term monitoring. So I'm done. I'm just going to put up the, the last slide, which I just added in response to some questions that were come up, because these were the recommendations that, that came out. They were the synthesis of, you know, the over the 200 authors that, that contributed to the book. And so these were some of the recommendations that were sort of synthesised at, um, uh, at the end of that for biodiversity. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Livy. Thank you for taking that brave slot. You handled it very well. Uh, very nice synthesis of everybody. Uh, thank you to all the presenters 
that have stuck around for any questions. Uh, if anyone does have any questions, now's the time. Jump on board. I know we're over time, but very rarely do you get these fabulous people sitting in a room wanting to talk to you. So feel free to ask a couple of questions, but also if you need to go, please do go. Um, and we will send around um, information about how to access the recordings of this when it's all compiled and also a little survey um, to get your feedback, yes, and also if you want to nominate other kind of symposiums as well. That's what we do at ANPC. So, yeah. Um, questions, anyone? Joe? Uh, there was one question from Annette to Andrew about which databases would be best to share data nationally. Yep. And, yeah, are you there, Andrew? Yeah. Yep. Did you yep. want to answer um, that? Yep. So I just had a bit of a think about that. I don't have a, a really strong answer to that question. So as far as I know, there's no one database that can deal with all the, the, the kind of material that we need to make a proper post-fire assessment of, of a species. So at this stage, it's probably best to choose a like a, a general flora uh, biodiversity database like Australian Atlas of Living Australia or Bionet or something like that. I know that there are some uh, fire particular databases in development and um, David Keith and others at UNSW are developing something like that, but I don't think that's yet um, launched and I'm not sure if there's the resources to get that, that job completed. Um, but the other thing you can do is if you are collecting material as part of a survey, if you lodge herbarium specimens with good notes about fire status and, and other relevant environmental data, that can be really helpful because we can get access to that. Great. Thanks, Andrew. I can't see any other questions, Sean. So. Maybe everyone's ready to head home. That's okay. I have lots of questions, but I will ask <laughs> offline because I know it is five o'clock and it is rush time. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate your time. And thank you to everyone at home who's watching as well. Thank you for coming. It's nice to be able to do this for you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.